Да. Okay. Next, uh, Matthias is going to present Stacking Sigmas, a framework to compose Sigma protocol for this junction. Join work with uh, <laughs> Guel, Matthew Green, Matthias himself, and Gabe Capture. Matthias? Yes. So I'm going to present Stacking Sigmas, so it gets started. So first, I'm going to be a bit of an introduction. So, like, the uh, the notation for this Sigma protocol and some prior works and where, where everything fits in. Then I'm going to introduce uh, stackable Sigma protocols, uh, which is the property that we need in order to be able to prove uh, space saving disjunctions. Then I'm going to give a primitive uh, called, partially bind commit, called partially binding commitments. Uh, and then I'm going to be able to present our compiler. Then I'm going to talk about uh, how do we get a logarithmic communication via recursively applying the compiler over and over again. Uh, and then finally, some, some wrapping up. So let's get started. So a, a Sigma protocol uh, is a free-run protocol that consists of a, a tuple of algorithms A, uh, Z, and Phi, such that you know the prover starts by generating the, the first round message, the commitment, uh, using the statement, the witness, and some random tape. It sends this to the water verifier, the verifier samples a uniformly random challenge, sends this to the prover, uh, and then the prover finishes the transcript by generating the, the last round message using the witness again and, and this challenge. And the verifier can check that the, that the transcript accepts using phi. So what's the goal of this talk? The goal of this talk is to have zero knowledge proofs for disjunctive statements. So uh, where, you, um, where you want to prove that the first statement is in the first language or the second statement is in the second language and so on until statement L and language L. And what we would like is that if proving uh, a statement uh, is in some language using a, a protocol pi i, requires some CC of pi i, then we would like to derive a, um, a protocol for the disjunctive, for the disjunctive relation uh, where the communication of the disjunctive, of this disjunctive protocol is uh, uh, significantly less than the concatenation of the transcripts. Um, what are some applications of this? The applications include like, ring signatures, branching communication, and, and um, witness indistinguishability from honest verifier zero knowledge. Okay, so, so in prior work, there's been a bunch of prior work on like uh, doing disjunctions of, of sigma protocols or disjunction, space paving disjunctions of, of, of other protocols. Um, but generally, they sort of fall into two, two categories. Either you have some generic compiler for, for sigma protocols, uh, and, and then the communication is just a concatenation of all the transcripts. Or you can get like, some communication saving, but for a particularly uh, constructed um, protocol. So then you deliberately design a protocol to, to, to get this uh, space saving. And this work follow, falls somewhere in between, the, in, in between the two. So what would we do is we um, get space saving disjunctions for a large class of sigma protocols, not all sigma protocols. Uh, where the communication is logarithmic in the number of clauses. Uh, furthermore, our compiler uh, conserves the concrete efficiency, so it's it's it's, it's like it's real world. So you can you can use it. Um, note that we can't do this for all sigma protocols because we can't use the um, the definition of a sigma protocol black box. But however, it it applies for a very very wide class of sigma protocols. Uh, here's just like a small handful of them. So like. If it's like of the form of a, like proving pre images of like homomorphism using these classic protocols, if, uh, if it's like MPC in the heads, then you could probably also do it. Um, and it also includes like the classical protocols like uh, for graph Hamiltonicity and others. So it relies on like no algebraic structure of, 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 the, of the language. Uh, and so which, which, which Sigma protocols does it apply to? So in order to build some intuition, let's start with this, uh, with this, uh, with this Sigma protocol for proving like one-way uh, pre-images of a one-way homomorphism. Uh, so uh, in this protocol, of which you know Shor, Snor is, a, is an inst instance, the prover starts by sampling a random element of the domain. He then applies the homomorphism, sends the image to the verifier. The verifier uh, samples a challenge, and the prover computes this uh, linear combination in the in uh, on the pre-image side, and since this uh, random uh, pre-image to the to the verifier, we then applies the homomorphism to verify that it's a valid pre-image. 
Okay, so how do you how do you simulate such a protocol? Uh, so the simulator, if you gave this like a student and asked him to write a simulator, uh, you know, like it works. You have a, you sample a third round uh, message independently of set, independently of the, oh, of x, sorry, independently of the statement. You just sample a, a random uh, thing from the domain, and then you compute uh, the accepting commitment uh, for this last round message given the challenge. And so the observation that we make in this paper is that in many Sigma protocols, uh, simulation uh, works similarly. Uh, namely, you sample some like third round message uh, from a distribution, which may depend on the challenge, but doesn't depend on the, on the statement, or perhaps depends on some like notion of size for the statement, but not the particular statement. And then uh, for a particular statement, you can then finish the transcript. You can compute the commitment that makes it uh, accepting for C. So, uh, for instance, one example is in many MPC in the head protocols, uh, the view of the open parties, which is uh, the final set, <coughs> uh, can, can often just be seen as like a, a string of like uniformly uh, random ring elements. Like it's a communication from the other parties and it's just usually just uniformly random. Okay, so let's formalize this slightly. So we say that a Sigma protocol is recyclable, has recyclable third round messages if the distribution of the last round message does not depend on the statement. It can depend on the challenge, but not the statement. Um, for the second property, we say that a, that a Sigma protocol is extended on as verifier zero knowledge. If when I give you a statement and a challenge C and a last round message, right? So this is, the, this is where it deviates for the no, normal definition of special on as verifier zero knowledge. If I also give you a random last round message, you can deterministically compute a first round message that makes the transcript accepting. And we say that if, if both are satisfied, we call the, the protocol staggerable, which means that our techniques apply. Okay, oops, and there we go. <clears throat> so here, here's, a, here's a, like the overall idea that doesn't quite work yet. There's some, some piece missing, but the idea is that when you have this definition or you have a, a protocol of this form, right? Suppose that we have a prover who has a witness and you want to prove that, you know, the witness and the first statement is like in the language is in the relation or the witness and the, uh, the second statement is in the relation. But the idea here is that he proves the satisfied clause using his witness. He somehow obtains a transcript uh, for, for, for the satisfied clause. And then he applies the sim extended simulator for the other clause using the same last round message. So he has, you know, the same challenge, the same last round message, two different first round messages. Unfortunately, there's sort of a chicken and egg problem here that, that means that this particular example does not quite work. Um, namely that, you know, the prover cannot generate the first round message for A A2 because he doesn't have a witness. He needs C to simulate. Um, at the same time, he cannot send A1 because that would reveal which clause is satisfied. And obviously the verifier cannot send the challenge before seeing A1 because otherwise the prover could just sim simulate both transcripts. Um, in order to get around this chicken egg problem, we introduced the notion of partially binding commitments. So uh, this is a, a commitment scheme in which we can have a committer, which is gonna be the, the prover, uh, can commit to two tuples and some index I in such a way that the prover can later equivocate at the position that is not I, but not in the I position. So you can equivocate, for instance, if, if I is one, he can equivocate on in V1, but not on V2. So you can equivocate on one of the two positions. The, the, the observation here is, the, the, the crucial thing here is that when the prover eventually, or when the committer eventually opens this commitment, the verifier does not learn which position was binding. This intuitively will enable the prover to send to one of the first two round messages, right? Because he's going to commit to one of them where he doesn't know which one, uh, but the verifier will never know which one. Uh, and now I would like to give you a, a very, very simple construction. So the construction that I'm going to give here is just from, from Patterson commitments. So in this case, you know, you have some sort of setup. That's like two generators. You don't know the discrete lock between them. Um, I'm gonna generate a commitment key and an equivocation key. So commitment key is just whatever you're gonna to use to, to commit and equivocation will enable equivocating in one of the, exactly one of the two positions. Uh, you're gonna generate this by selecting the equivocation key. It's just a random trapdoor, right? So it's a, 
so it's a, it's a scalar, and you're going to form uh, this H for the other position. So if, if I is one, this is like H two. You're going to set that to G two, your your, your trapdoor, and then you're going to pick you know H one. But that when I multiply G two to uh, G two and, and H one and H two, I get H. And then the commitment key is just going to be you know H one. Then in order to commit. I'm simply going to compute uh, H2 from, from H, what was given in the setup, and, uh, and H1. Uh, and then uh, I'm just going to commit using two individual Patterson commitments. So I'm going to form the, the final commitment as uh, G2 or awesome some randomness, H1 to V1, G2 some other randomness, H2 to V2. How do you equivocate? Well, you equivocate uh, like you normally would for a Patterson commitment. So the, to say one of the, you can definitely change you know, the equivocal position. It is also not hard to see that if you can equivocate in both positions uh, using the standard, like the way that you normally uh, reduce the binding of Edison commitments, you will get the discrete log of both H1 and, and H2 and G. And then by the relation between the two, you also get the discrete log of, of H. Okay. So now with this, with this uh, very simple tool, the, the new idea is, you know, the, the prover is going to uh, generate the first round message. It's going to generate an equivocation key that is binding in the position where he actually has a has a witness for for, for the clause that he has a witness for. Then he's going to send the commitment key and this and a commitment to the first round message and some garbage in in the in the other position. And then the verifier is going to send the challenge to the prover. The prover can then finish the transcript for which he actually has a witness. And then he can simulate the other transcripts uh, using the challenge. And then finally, he can equivocate such that he opens it to the tuple uh, of the two first round messages. Okay, slightly more detail, right? So at the prover, he generates uh, an equi commitment key and equivocation key for i equal one in the case. This, this is the clause for which he has a witness. Um, then he generates the first round message. He sends over a commitment. He gets a challenge. He runs set to get the, the final uh, message of the of the of the first uh, transcript. Then he simulates the second transcripts and he equivocates uh, using the randomness of the original commitment and uh, his newly simulated first round message. And he sends over the last round message, the random and and the and the randomness of the equivocation. Then the verifier can regenerate you know the first two round messages and he can check that it matches the opening of the commitment. Okay, so at this point we have a not super exciting compiler that you know takes a, a, a sigma protocol that would have had two last round messages and it gives you a sigma protocol that has one last round messages, one last round message like compared to CDS. But what's the trick now, right? So the trick here is that it, this compiler it takes a, a stackable sigma protocol for a language with some communication complexity CC of pi, and it gives you a, a stackable sigma protocol. Uh, for the language of disjunctions, so uh, x1 is an L or x2 is an L, uh, where the communication overhead is essentially just that of the partially binding commitment scheme. <coughs> now the trick here is that say I have a I have a disjunction of four clauses. If I have a disjunction of four clauses, I can mute it as a disjunction of disjunctions of two clauses. And I already have a, a sigma protocol for disjunction of uh, uh, for two disjunction. So what I can do is I can simply take the protocol that I was given. I can take pi prime, and I can stack it again. So I simply feed it into the into the into the compiler again. The second time it comes out of the compiler, right? I'm going to have you know CC of the original pi plus two times the overhead of the partially uh, binding commitment scheme. So in general, I'm going to end up with like log two of, um, of L times some some small constant time security parameter plus the uh, uh, communication complexity of the original uh, protocol. <clears throat> uh, lastly, before I wrap up, I would like to describe a slight generalization. So it turns out that you can generalize this to distinct protocols as long as uh, they share the same distribution over last round messages or it's indistinguishable. Or in the case where you can sort of trivially convert one into the other by like packing or padding the, the last round message. So how does this work? Like informally, you simply finish the transcript for, 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 for the protocol execution that you, you do have a witness for, you obtain the transcript as before, and then you simulate using the same set. 
So just as in, in the case of a single protocol. So for instance, if you have like a, an instance of KKW over uh, Boolean circuits, and you have an instance of KKW over a uh, larger ring, where you know the size of the ring is like some, some power of two, uh, then in, in, in both cases, you can sort of view the set as just uh, being like a string of random bits, because of the uniformly random field elements pack them as uniformly random bits. In this case, you can do a disjunction between two, two parallel executions of the protocol. Um, finally, I would uh, encourage you to see the full paper, and uh, I would like to th thank you for your attention. Okay, do we have any questions? <coughs> Uh, so it's very cool that you get the some result for protocols like KKW. I'm curious though, can you say anything about composition in the, in the sense that some parts of the circuit will be stacked and others will not be stacked? Oh, um, we we have thought about that, but it's not super super easy. I mean, no, no, not really. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, we thought about it, but that's not an elegant solution. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. The 